Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 14 of The Layover. On tonight's show, Lindsay gets her dancing shoes on, Mark is plagued by hornets, and I reminisce about an old girlfriend. Welcome oh, to The Layover Live. One life for the revolution. Drink. He's going to be drinking. Oh. Oh. Go out again. Oh, uh, it's, it's it's right. I'm uh, hi, hello, everyone. How are you? Okay, thanks. Okay, how are you? Yeah, really good, actually. Got my new t shirt on, the layover t shirt. Yes, I was in the post. Right? Yeah, where's that? Where's it, it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was only because um, John Nielsen didn't send us any C130 t shirts for this week. It was a Bit of a blow when Lockheed Martin cut the budget on the t shirts. Uh, but never mind. What have you been up to, Mark? I saw you went flying, didn't you? I, I did a, a little tiny bit of flight work. Well, so we're allowed a critical maintenance flight. There we go. That's, I was, was going to say that's me flying. That is not me flying. That is me taking a photo of me flying. Um, we're allowed a critical maintenance flight. My aeroplane hasn't flown since early December. Um, and it's sort of wet and rusty and and so on. So we need to wooden propeller. Yeah, and wooden propellers. You have to be a bit careful. Wooden propellers. Make sure they don't kind of get loose and fall off. So um, ran beautifully. Checked all the radios, transponder, everything worked perfectly. Twenty minutes. It just, just so happened that it was a glorious day to do it as well. Absolutely was, stunning. By the look of it. That. Was, uh, it was lovely. It was a little grey, but. Uh, yeah, it was lovely. It was lovely and very quiet. Very few other airplanes around, obviously. I've been miserable all week, Scott. Oh, go on. Why? Well, I tried my work trousers on. <gasps> oh, yeah, because you're coming back to work soon, aren't you? Bad news. <laughs> <laughs> Do they fit like my work trousers? What One yeah. leg was okay. <laughs> I got past the knee. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've got four weeks and times of, it's it's desperate times. So I've been on a diet this week and poor Mark's had to bear the brunt of it because I've been a little bit miserable. Um, but the one thing that did pick me up was, have you seen the video that's been going around that everyone's been dancing to? Uh, no, I've I, I had some spare time this week. So I've seen these two and I've done you a bit of a favour uh, in doing this. How did it all start though? So... Austrian and Ryanair started doing this, um, well, it's a dance to Jerusalem is the song. And it's Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I'm say, not sure how you say, you say it. Salima, I say, I say um, Salima, yeah. So it's a gospel influenced house song by South African producer, Master KG. And it's gone viral. <laughs> like loads of people are doing, like different companies, <laughs> airlines are doing a little dance to this. And we've got a, a gospel influenced house song. Well, apparently so. It, who could make it up? Look, it does look a little bit like this. With South African stuff, so. Yeah, it looks a little bit like this, though. Yeah.
<laughs> but as hard as that. Sorry, it cut off at the end there. I got I got bored of mixing yeah. the two together. I can yeah. I can imagine you know caterpillaring. Yeah, that'd be. I think it's the worm or whatever it is. Whatever it is. The thought of you two. That. The thought of you two doing that horrifies me. Really? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> should we should we have the other version? Do you think? No. <laughs> Are you going to tell anyone about your dog walk well, in the chat with the bloke down the road? Just for me. Oh, yeah. So I was like taking the dog for a run and I bumped into my neighbour who's got a little uh, Labrador called Reggie, who's lovely. And um, I said to him that I was going back to work. And he said, oh, um, you know, who do you work for? So I told him and he said, oh, you know, do you know Janice? And I said, oh, no, I, I don't. I don't know Janice. No, she she crew. And he said, yeah, I, said, oh, I, I don't really know very many cabin crew. And he said, oh, right. I thought I thought you flew. I was like, yes. A little bit of bias going on here. A little bit of gender bias. And he was lovely. Female plus flying must equal cabin crew. Yeah. So that was interesting. But, you know, I just... Uh oh uh -oh. my gentle sphere back to... Back to Did you set world. your dog on him? What, Milo? Milo? Have you seen Milo? <laughs> <laughs> he was licking to death. Oh, it's... Oh, that... I, I, you know what? Uh, we, we talked about it, didn't we, with uh, Kelly? And we talked about it with... <laughs> in fact, even Bonnie... Um, when people were talking about a space doctor, they assumed that the space doctor was was a male. Yeah, bizarre. Oh, uh, how do we fix it? Uh, who knows? It's going to be a long time, I think, generations until we fix it. But we can still influence it here and say that all three of us are pilots. There we are. Um, yes, and uh, all three of us may soon be back at work. Right. <laughs> if Lindsay can fit into her trousers. Yeah, I mean, right. <laughs> um, Mark, I, I saw you were discussing yeah. hornets this week. Yes, yes, it is the uh, so that so the last of the regular hornets has come off the um, the uh, last of the sort of uh, so it's the Carl Vinson, which is the the aircraft carrier that the the Hornet's been on. So it's been replaced by the Super Hornet, which is a bit bigger all round. I don't know if you know, but Super Hornet doesn't have a speed brake. You know, these oh, are really? the old ones have a big speed brake, and uh, it's all done through flight controls and things now. So it's all very clever, the new ones. But, yep, the old one is gone. And, um, it, they, I mean, they were introduced about 40 years ago. So I think they came into service, and I think it was 84. Um, wow. So first flight in 78, it says here, um, Boeing acquired, acquired the program in 97 when it uh, merged with McDonnell Douglas, so it's now got, got Boeing in the, in the name. Um, and, uh, yeah, fantastic aeroplane. Of course, you know, it's going to be the star of the next Top Gun movie as well. Oh, yeah. Um, talking about Top Gun, mm. have yeah. you seen the F-18s in the Lego Top Gun awesome. thing that's been done. It's awesome. I, it is absolutely awesome. It's so awesome. We're going to have a, quite a video heavy, heavy pre-show today because <laughs> I've managed to get a clip of this. Um, it was done by a YouTube creator called On Beatman, and basically what he's done is he's taken the Top Gun Maverick trailer and recreated the entire thing in Lego. This is, the, I, we can talk about it later, but I think this is utterly amazing. Watch this. Your instructor is one of the finest pilots this program has ever produced. His exploits are legendary. What he has to teach you may very well mean the difference between life and death. Your reputation precedes you. I have to admit I wasn't expecting an invitation back. 
They're called orders, Maverick. I thought, was, I thought it was awesome. I, I we could watch that forever, but I'm I'm conscious of the time. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I was going to say, I mean, if you want if you want to listen to a really good podcast that involves a lot of F 18s then um, uh, Fighter Pilot Podcast, the Fighter Pilot Podcast, very good indeed. Uh, he's a former F eighteen instructor and uh, Top Gun instructor. Uh, they've got a couple of good episodes on the Blue Angels because I didn't realise how very specialised their airplanes were. So they are currently converting from the old Hornet, which is that one, uh, to the new one uh, and to make it fit for their show, um, which is really cool. What other, aer- what, uh, what other aeroplane do the Blue Angels fly, Scotty? Ah, yes, the Blue Angels have got a C-130G now, um, oh. which is a, it's an ex-British one. This used to belong to the RAF. Nice. I quite like the paintwork. Yeah, they, it's pretty cool. They bought it secondhand from the RAF. Um, it's uh, what the RAF would call a Mark IV, which is the, the, the shorter one. Um, they bought it. Marshals of Cambridge did a, a cracking job sticking some blue, yellow, and white on it, and this now supports the Blue Angels all over the place. Wow. Um, I wouldn't get into that flight suit. I'd just like to put that out there. That's how I feel in my work trousers. I'm now all into their flight suits. I, I think uh, I think I wouldn't even get their flight suits over one of my legs. It would be it would be embarrassing. So Scott, from from one Top Gun trailer to who, someone else who thought they were a Top Gun, did you see the um, Cub video this week? Oh, good lord! Yeah. Oh, Jesus! Please yeah. don't. Um, You're not going to play it. I, I, I am going to play a little bit of it, I, and the reason I'm only going to play a little bit is so that we can have a very brief discussion about the the controversy that this particular uh, thing caused. We're not going to name the individual, however, there is on his own, it is posted to his own Instagram account, his company's Instagram account, which is actually on here. Um, I'm just going to show a very little bit, a brief bit about it, and then then we'll come back and talk about it. I think that's enough, uh, really. Um, uh, there was lots of people on uh, lots of social media platforms couldn't figure out why uh, I particularly had an issue with with that type of flying. Um, it just takes unnecessary risk and is just dangerous, really. Um, that's my view. Um, I, I'll. Yeah, it's like the opposite of Bob Hoover for me. You know, when you watch watch old Bob Hoover displays and he's super s- silky and uh, smooth and fluid and uh, yeah plus he nearly got hit from above by a wave <laughs> I mean that's uh, all you need to know really yeah I agree um, and, and it doesn't matter what pilot's experience or training there's no experienced display pilot in the world that would f- be flying under the crest of a wave that I can think of never mind shall we leave it at that and move on and move that. on to the next Let's bit yeah, let's let's leave it at that and move on to the next bit. Um, Mark, I saw this amazing picture, um, <laughs> and it completely bamboozled me. What is this about? Well, a uh, 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 gentleman who follows me uh, posted it. it. That is the load deck of a C seventeen. I know we're going to talk about Herx, but uh, and they are seven eight replica Newports. Uh, I think they were being flown from Canada because it's the Royal Canadian Air Force. There's some sotwiths in the back background, I think, to France for sort of a, a Great War reenactment thing. But it just shows you what a massive load area that is. Um, and it's it's brilliant. Anyway, we had lots of Wing Friday stuff going on. I thought it was a really good, unusual Wing Friday image. Oh, yeah, really cool. Yeah, really um, cool. Many months ago, I think one of our viewers saw this at 
and it might have been Linden, I think, saw yeah. this at Gloucester Airport, and it's popped up on the Rolls-Royce website today. Um, this is a 300 miles per hour carbon fiber, all electric airplane. I know we've done electric airplanes before, but this looks awesome. Mm. It does look good, doesn't it? It does. I, I just... I just wonder if I'd be able to fit in there unless I get on Lindsay's diet because it does look quite small. You're not getting but, in there. Yeah, no. whether it's have the lift to get me off the ground. Gorgeous though, isn't it? Huge, huge electric motors, uh, huge, huge batteries, um, and uh, they're aiming for 300 miles an hour. I mean, it looks. I mean, there's not a lot of sort of tail feather surface back there. It looks quite exciting um, from a sort of flying point of view. I do know that gentleman who's flying it a little bit actually so oh really i wonder if we can oh, so this is just isn't a concept they're actually flying this now are they they have got well they're, they're ground running it from from what um from the video that i saw yeah oh wow sounds amazing right so enough of us enough of us yeah, now nice. yeah let's uh, enough about us let's let's move on to tonight's guest tonight we've got the pleasure of speaking with lawrence or he's better known larry galogley um, Larry started out his career wanting to play hockey, actually, not wanting to fly, which is a little bit bizarre. Uh, but his passion for flying arose around an opportunity to do both, uh, and Larry embraced it with both hands. Uh, during his flying training, a chance encounter uh, with the C-130 made Larry realise that actually that was the plane for him. It looked like a lot of fun, and I can attest to that the c-130 has always been the party fleet no matter what air force you're in um larry has gone uh, through regular service to the rhode island national guard uh the latter seeing larry uh, take out the first tactical deployments for the usaf of the c-130j into the gulf larry is now the tactical airlift aficionado he regularly talks globally uh, on the existing and future capabilities of air mobility. He, in his role of Director of Business Development for Air Mobility at Lockheed Martin. Larry, welcome to our layover. How are you? Well, I'm doing well, uh, Scotty. Thank you very much for having me. I was listening to the intro there, and I, you said you were going to reminisce about an old girlfriend. I thought I might have been on the wrong show. <laughs> You might well be. It might be a little bit more niche than you expect. I, I didn't I didn't plan those stories, but you know, I'll try to come up with some if you'd like. <laughs> um Larry, welcome. Um I know we've had a, a bit of a chat before uh, we started, but everyone has a uh, their own story of how they got into aviation. I know yours is slightly different because you didn't initially start with aviation in your blood. You had sport was was a big focus. Um, tell us how you got into aviation to begin with. Well, Scotty, that's exactly right. You know, I grew up in Rhode Island and Rhode Island is more of a Navy town, but uh, I actually at the old Quonset Naval Air Station back in World War II, that was the largest naval air station on the eastern seaboard uh, with the commensurate aircraft carriers and everything else. I, but it, it, it never really uh, grabbed me at that time. I used to go down to their, their festivals once a year and look at the ships and the, the carriers and the submarines, but I never really got bitten by the aviation bug. Uh, and and as, as you alluded to, I, uh, I did fancy myself a hockey player at one point in time. And I had the opportunity, the coach of the Air Force Academy uh, had been in our area and said, when, why don't you come out to Colorado Springs and play hockey? Which seemed like a great idea. I didn't have anything else to do at the time. So uh, I went out to the Air Force Academy and of course, I was in the minority there because everybody was so focused on aviation and you're surrounded by it. And every day it's the history and the great aviators through time. Uh, and, uh, and you quickly catch the bug. Uh, so, th so that's how I really uh, got into the aviation side of it. I, I, I always say that, you know, things happen for a reason and, uh, 
And I think I ended up at the Air Force Academy for a reason and, and had that great experience. And that led me to my aviation career. So, so Larry, you, how does it work, the, the sort of an, the American process? You turn up to the sort of re recruitment center for the Air Force. And because for many of us here, we only sort of are familiar with how the, the UK system works. So, so for the Air Force Academy, um, it's it's much like you're applying for any other university, oh, okay. um, and only you apply to con you apply to the academy, and your congressional leaders, the senators and congressmen, the politicians, have so many appointments that they can make to the academy. So each oh. each state has a competitive process to identify who they whom that state will send to the academy for that particular year. So I had to go through that process and uh, apply uh, and get uh, meet all those require, minimum requirements and then get accepted to the academy to be able to go and play hockey there. And then it's, then it's a four year university. Um, only there's really no break during the, the summer. Uh, you have uh, you got three weeks break, but everything else is pretty solid uh, training throughout the year. In the summer, it was specialized training. Some people would go to their um, their flight training portion there and start in the Cessnas in the T-41 aircraft. Others would fly uh, sailplanes during the summer. You could parachute during the summer. Oh, there you go. Yeah. And, and uh, then upon graduation, you would get assigned to go to a formal pilot training base. Uh, if you were pilot, if you were qualified for pilot training, you know, uh, visual, et cetera, uh, you would go down and uh, pick your pilot training base and away you'd go. Wow. And so what, what sort of aircraft did you, I know you've mentioned some of them, but how does the sort of the flying training structure work? How do you sort of progress on to... The, you know, the different stages of training? Sure. So as it, you start in that T-41 first, yeah. and then upon graduation and you go to formal pilot training, the first phase of formal pilot training for, for us way back then was uh, T-37s. And you'd have that T-37 training. Uh, if you, you'd make it through the T-37 program, you would then graduate to the T-38 program. I, you know, I know you were talking about the Blue Angels earlier. There was a time the Thunderbirds flew T-38s. Um, so uh, it was really kind of a, a rocket ship and, uh, and a great airplane uh, and a lot of fun to fly. And I actually had a, one of my instructor pilots in the T-38 was a, a guy named Tom Carrigan. And he turned out to previously, before he was a pilot training instructor, he was a C-130 pilot. And uh, that was a big part of my exposure to C-130s early on. Okay. So as you're going through this training, when do you sort of make the decision as to what aircraft you want to end up on? How far into training? Are you sort of streamed in one direction? Do you have any influence over where you go? At, at that point in time, uh, so the answer is kind of yes to both. At that point in time, you would, as you got into T-38s and, and it appeared you were going to make it through the program, you would then fill out what, what we call the dream sheet. Okay. And you, you would list what aircraft you wanted to fly in order. And then you would also list where you wanted to go and fly. And they actually had a... Uh, a box you could check that say, you know, you'd say what takes precedence, the airplane you want to fly or the place you want to go. Okay. And and virtually everybody would just say the airplane. You know, I, I don't care where I'm flying it. I just want to fly that airplane. So you'd fill out your dream sheet and then they would have an assignment night when every class would get their, their drop of airplanes because it wasn't the same a block of airplanes for every class. It just depended on what the needs of the Air Force were at that time. Sure. So you could you could get a lot of C-130s. You might be might get a lot of uh, F-15s. You might get 
a lot of uh, B-52s. It could be anything. And, and they would get, um, you know, a pretty good mix throughout. The, the number one person in class, the top graduate, um, which wasn't me, I, I got their first choice of aircraft. And then after that, it was strictly by chance. So it, it just it de- depended on how many fighters, how many bombers, how many mobility aircraft came down as to what aircraft you would get. So I got my first choice of aircraft being the C-130, but my fifth choice of base. Uh, I had listed all the overseas bases at the time as my first priority. Uh, I got my fifth choice, which was Little Rock Air Force Base. Okay. Wow. And then, here you go. Kind of uh, the cool thing was it was uh, it it is Mecca for C 130s. I at the time we had, if I recall, seventy two C 130s uh, on the ramp there at uh, Little Rock, which of course is far more than most countries. Uh, have in their inventory. <laughs> so it was pretty impressive. And I always remember when I was um, I was driving to little driving into Little Rock with my my soon to be wife, uh, then fiance, and all she had seen as far as airplanes was T-38s flying around at, at Columbus Air Force Base down in Mississippi. And we pulled on to the base at Little Rock and she sees these airplanes and she's like, oh, my God, they're going to fall out of the sky. She said, you're going to fly those? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But it turned out to be a a great choice for me, led to many opportunities and and a whole lot of fun. Uh, You know, my uh, my dad. Uh, he used to say that millionaires and military get to see the world. Uh, nobody else really does. And when I think of all the places that the C-130 has taken me to, I I look back and I say, boy, that that's really true. Yeah. And, and Larry, so just briefly going back to the, I guess, sort of reverse through your airplanes there. T-38, not an easy airplane to fly, still in service, but but not an, not an easy airplane to fly at all. And it's kind of really unusual to us um, that, that uh, in your military system, you get all the way to what we would call a kind of lead-in airplane. And then at the end of it, they say, okay, so where do you want to go? Multi-engine airplanes or or whatever. Is that, so the T-38 twin engine? Yeah, yeah. So the system has changed now a bit where now they try to put you on a track. If you're going to fly fighters or you're going to fly mobility aircraft, at the time, that was not the case. Uh, It was all kind of uh, up in the air as to what you were going to get. And of course, a lot of it did uh, was determined by where you finished in your class, where your class rank was. Right. Uh, But it it was, uh, again, it was a great experience. And, you know, things happen for a reason. Uh, I think I uh, ended up with Tom Carrigan as my instructor in T-38s for a reason. And I pushed me on a path that uh, that really was fabulous. And w- was there one thing he said that made you think? Well, you know, well, it's actually a good story. Uh, we were flying our cross-country mission. You always got to fly a cross-country mission as you got toward graduation and they would teach you the en route system a little bit and all the things that you couldn't learn just flying there around the flagpole. And we were flying from Columbus, Mississippi to up to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. And and we landed at Wright-Pat and there was a C-130 on the ramp. And we got out of our T-38 and he looked at me and he, he said, hey, that C-130 is open, let's go. And, and we go running over to this C-130 and he climbs up on the flight deck and he looked like a little boy on Christmas morning. He was so excited to be back in that element. And he had all these memories of his C-130 and flying the C-130 and everything it could do. And really it was at that moment that I said, that's, that's the airplane right there. Uh, if he could be that excited about it, 
after having been out of the airplane for a few years, uh, that was the plane for me. Uh, it fit my personality well uh, and all, and uh, that was not a mistake. That It was really kind of fortuitous <clears throat> that we got up there and found a C-130 that was open. Mm. Uh, that's, that's extraordinary, isn't it, to see that kind of level of excitement and enthusiasm. It really just very, very, very lovely. Um, so it, I think from um, we're sort of moving into C-130 territory, but did the did those kind of aeroplanes that you led in on, did they kind of prepare you well for flying an aeroplane like the, the 130? He, you know, it, it's all those basic aviation skills that apply regardless of what airplane you're flying that you had to learn. And that was that was very, very vital uh, to me. And everything about a basic cross check and where instruments are located in the airplane and how that matters and and everything else. Uh, and, and building the discipline really that it takes to fly any airplane. And, and I know uh, you three all flying, uh, discipline is so critical and People, you might see somebody say, oh, come on, let's go flying. And if they if they weren't the type that follows checklists and does things, you know, in order and uh, does all their inspections, you'd be very leery about getting in an airplane with them. Yeah. Uh, so pilot training prepared you well for all of that. Uh, and then and then getting into the larger crew airplane, learning how to manage a crew and work within a crew. Uh, was quite interesting as well, and uh, and fortunately, I had some very good uh, senior leaders that were both enlisted crew members on the airplane as well as uh, senior officers on the airplane that really trained us uh, very very well. And and uh, a great squadron that I came on at Little Rock with the 50th uh, TAC Airlift Squadron I, that had all of those uh, mentors. And, you know, we didn't call them mentors at the time, but they were phenomenal mentors that yeah. shaped how you flew uh, in, in tremendous experience. Yeah, Larry, I, I'm just going to interject. I, I've had a, a message from a friend of yours, um, uh, from Marcus Janito. He sent me a message, uh, and he said, the only reason you went to C C-130s was you got cranky if you didn't get fed after three hours, so fast jets wasn't for you. Um, <laughs> That that was that's a friend of yours who made that comment. So I, I'll just do it. The, he's right, by the way. I I do need regular feedings, or, or I do get quite angry. Um, I I can see we can all how everyone can get excited about the C one hundred and thirty. I flew it, as you know, it's amazing aircraft. Before we talk about the C one hundred and thirty, let's just whet everybody's appetite with a video about the J.
Wow. Well, a couple of a couple of things there. Number one, refueling helicopters scares the hell out of me. Uh, I think we would just I just need to get that said. Number two, hellfires. I think AGM sixty fives. So you know, Mark, the one thing I regretted about my career that I was too early in my career to have missiles strapped to the wings of the C one thirty. We we always we always wanted that. And, and, you know, we always said it was a good idea. And uh, the, it took the engineers far too long to actually do it. But when you look at that, uh, that the Marine Corps, that's their Harvest Talk mission with the Hellfires on the wing, that is pretty cool. <laughs> you know, and, and then you think about everything else the C-130 does with the, with the gunship and uh, the 105 howitzers on it and the, the uh, 30 millimeters on it. And and soon, I I think we can talk about this a little later. But soon we'll have lasers on it as well. So there's uh, there's lots of cool things. You know what hasn't the airplane done? But that's a real cool video. Thanks for showing that. That's uh, I have seen that a number of times, and I uh, it never stops uh, exciting me actually to see everything that this airplane does. And Larry, I was kind of sitting there going, oh, yeah, it does that. Oh, it does that. Oh, yeah, it does that. And it does that. And it does that. And it does. And it's kind of, it's the most amazingly versatile airplane. I, ha I have to give it credit, much as I hate with Scotty on the call to, to kind of give it credit. But it's it's up there with the DC-3, C-47. Have you flown all of the 130 variants in your in your distinguished career? So, so I have not, I, but I... I believe I'm one of only, I think, two people who has been qualified in the the A model, the E model, and the J model. I, I never flew the H model, I, and I never flew uh, B models. <clears throat> but very, there just aren't that many people that have A model experience. Um, and because I went from active duty to the Air National Guard. Uh, we had A models uh, in Rhode Island at the Guard when I first went there. And uh, I, it was a, a step back in time, I'll tell you that. It was very, very different flying, especially trying to uh, check out as an instructor pilot because the instrumentation in, in the A model is so totally different than all of the other airplanes. Okay. Like, Would you yeah. give us a quick, I think we've got a slide with the two different cockpits, but could you maybe give us 60 seconds on how you get from A to E to, uh, well, we sure. have J. Sure, now, now in this picture you're showing is the uh, E model cockpit on the left side and the J model cockpit on the right. And uh, by the way, that picture of the J model cockpit is taken on the ramp at Rhode Island. Uh, you, if you look through the windscreen, you can see the Rhode Island markings on the tails of those aircraft parked in front there. Um, so the A model uh, was take that E model cockpit and send it back in time another couple of decades. Uh, we, we had to, to try to fly as an instructor in the right seat. The biggest instrument on the right side of the cockpit was a directional gyro. And, and it was huge. It took up the vast majority of the uh, of the screen in front of you was this directional gyro, and it didn't work. Oh. It just <laughs> if if you if you went into any type of big turn, you would actually cage the gyro so it wouldn't spin. You'd roll out on your heading. You'd twist the gyro around to your heading, and then it would kind of give you good left and right from there. But in any big turn, it was worthless. And I remember getting checked out in the A model. Now, I, I had thousands of hours of C-130 time uh, by that point in time and going to the A. So I, I was an experienced 130 pilot. But I got in the airplane and my instructor pilot checking me out in the A model was a, a guy named Mike Hickey, a, a great guy and a great pilot. And I looked at him. I said, how do I fly an instrument approach from over here? And he said, oh, just look over on the pilot side like everybody else does. 
So you literally, the instrumentation was so bad on the right side, you literally would fly cross cockpit trying to fly instruments down uh, if you were flying an instrument approach from the right seat. Um, and, and, so and the air, oh, I'm was sorry. It designed almost like for another age where, where you had a, a pilot and then everybody else was just kind of helping the pilot out or? Well, I, I think it was designed in an age where you didn't have all the redundancies that we have today. And, and uh, for example, you had one um, compass system. There was no backup compass on the airplane. You had one compass system. That was it. I, and uh, uh, the airplane had, very, the A model had very little gas. They, they put these little external tanks on it. Uh, that were so tiny, they didn't make up for the drag that they caused with the gas that they uh, they held, and and that goes, you know, you you got that comment in from uh, from Marcus Gennetto. Uh, he and I were actually on a mission from Panama up to Guatemala in the A model, and we took off out of Panama, and everything was supposed to be glorious, you know, good weather day, etc. We get up to Guatemala. And it is nothing uh, is glorious about this day. There are, are embedded thunderstorms everywhere. It was miserable. And the terrain, very steep terrain. I, and, and Marcus had this radar, this old radar at the nav station and, and a, a rubber cone that he would force his head into to try to navigate through. And, uh, what we and we didn't have any gas to go anywhere else, so you didn't have options. You couldn't say, "Well, the weather's too bad. I'll turn around. I'll go home. I'll divert here. I'll divert there." You had no gas. You were out of ideas at that point. So, uh, Marcus, I was in the right seat uh, at the time, and, and as I said, Marcus was the nav, and our pilot, who was with us that day, actually just froze up on us. He, he just, he was overwhelmed by the circumstance and just froze and was just gazing out of the, the cockpit into Neverland and wasn't doing anything and I literally had to take the airplane, look at Marcus, we were in a hole in the weather, we're moving toward the field and, and I just said, Marcus, just keep me in the hole and tell me when we're over the field. And which is exactly what he did. He did a phenomenal job of keeping us right in the in the middle of this hole between all these thunderstorms. And we got when we got atop the field, we circled. I, I just spiraled down as tightly and as fast as I could to get down below the clouds with all of this terrain around you. And it was one of those missions, you know, you, you got out of the airplane, you kissed the ground and you were just thankful to do it. But uh you know that day, I was really thankful. I had uh, I had a great partner in Marcus who had the skills to to get me to that position where we could put it on the ground. Yeah. So, Larry, talking about situations that are you know somewhat hot or slightly dangerous, the C one hundred and thirty J model. Am I right in thinking that it was a National Guard unit that was the first unit to take that into conflict? I, you are, <laughs> you are right. I see that nice hero picture uh, there. Uh, who is that young man? I, uh, yes, and and I'll I'll tell you, um, Lindsay. It was it was really one of the one of the great memories I have uh, in the service. Is uh, we were the first. We were selected to lead that deployment. Rhode Island was selected to lead that. Now we had members from Maryland go with us and California and Mississippi, the Keesler unit. So it was truly a group effort, but we got to take those airplanes over to the desert for the first time for the USAF. Now the RAF had already been using them in theater and the Aussies had been using them in theater. They, they were, they'd gotten the airplanes earlier and they were very aggressive with them and doing great things but we hadn't taken them yet. Uh, that was in 2004. We deployed from 2004 into 2005. And the air, it was a test deployment to see what the airplane would do. And it was kind of fortuitous that during that deployment, there was 
a, uh, a crack found on the legacy 130s. And those airplanes had to be inspected. Now we had two, air, two G models with us in theater. We were flying one airplane a day. Uh, it was a very comfortable schedule, but it was, again, it was a test deployment. And the, uh, the general came to me at the time because even though the other Hercs had to be inspected, the missions didn't let up. You were still flying the same number of missions. So he came to me and, and he said, Larry, what do you think the airplane can do? And, and I honestly, I looked at him, I said, sir, I, I have no idea. Uh, but why don't we find out? I, I wow. said, let's just get, wow. I said, let's just schedule a hundred percent every day and we'll just fly them till they break. And uh, we flew the airplanes without any uh, maintenance issues, both airplanes uh, every day, 18 days. We put one airplane down and on the 19th day, we put the other airplane down. And the only reason we put the airplanes down for a day is because I couldn't handle the maintenance guys yelling at me every day that they needed time just to clean them up, you know, and give them some care and feeding. I, but I say it was fortuitous because everybody in the U.S. Air Force saw what the airplane could do. And they, they saw how reliable it was. They saw that some of the, we call them urban legends, uh, were not really true. You know, they said, oh, it's a composite propeller. It's not going to hold up going into the dirt landings and everything else. No issue whatsoever. They held up great. As a matter of fact, we changed one propeller. And the only, t the only reason we changed the propeller was as a precaution before it went back across the pond going home. So the propellers were phenomenal. Uh, the computer systems held up good. Everything was really, really good. Um, and it, it was, uh, I tell you, we did have, um, it has a de-icing boot. The J model has a de-icing boot on the tail. And, and we got a hole in that de-icing boot. And we didn't have the kit to fix it. And the one thing I had asked for before we deployed was, the, you know, Lockheed actually wanted to send a bunch of engineers with us so we would have all the answers right there and not fail on our missions. And I had said, no, that's not a good idea. You'll never do that in real life. So we're not going to do it on this test deployment. I said, but what I would like is I need to have an engineer at the other end of the phone so that when something does go wrong, I can pick up the phone and call an engineer that will know, uh, can I fly with this? Can I not fly with this? Because unlike the legacy airplanes, you know, you knew every sound they made. You knew all the things you could fly with and not fly with. But that wasn't the case on the J. And when we got that hole in the uh, in the de-icing boot, the old Herc guy, I said, well, the old airplanes didn't have it. So how important can it be? And I called called the engineer and he's like, no, 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 don't fly into icing without that de-icing boot. I'm like, oh. he said, well, he said, different airflow, different, different, different. And I'm like, okay. Uh -huh. um, the bad thing was the kit to fix it was about the size of a shoebox. It is such a simple repair and we didn't bring the repair kit with us. And I, I wish there was somebody else I could blame for that. <laughs> but we actually decided what we would bring with us and not bring with us. And we thought we'd, wow, we're not going to need that. I never thought to ask, well, how big is it? You know, we could have put it anywhere. It's the size of my lunch. I think, I think de-icing in the middle of the desert, I think people would probably forgive you for that one. That that's not one you're going to need in the middle of summer. I, I, <laughs> Just doing it. Um, Larry, you, you've talked about earlier on, in fact, uh, Marcus stitched you up about you needing to be fed every three hours. But And you've talked about the engineers feeding the aeroplane. Um, but how do you actually eat on these planes? Like, you know, I, I've been on them. Mark, in fact, has had the most amazing baguettes made fresh on board. <laughs> Um, that, that he, they were famed for these enormous baguettes that we used to have on the Air Force ones. Um, but what's the new one got? That because I've never been on the new one. So yeah, we used to have the the ovens on the legacy airplanes, and you and the hot uh, cups and everything, and you could really get pretty creative with what you could do. The new airplanes, 
uh, have transitioned to a microwave. So we now have a J model on a microwave, uh, which is very nice. See, now I will tell you, Scotty, this is the second microwave that they put in. The first microwave that they had on the airplane actually filled up that whole space. And it was quite nice because you could put anything in it. Then we went to this little tiny microwave that you couldn't put much in it. You couldn't put a TV dinner in it. Uh, so uh, we were a little disappointed that we went back to the small microwave. But having a microwave is very, very nice. Pop some popcorn, you know, little things to help you uh, pass some of the time as you go along. That's sounds cool. cool. So, um, it's, uh, so they, they, you, you mentioned the, the J model there. I mean, they look very similar. Okay. So the, the E and the J, you know, to the uninitiated, they look, they look very, very similar, but you've kind of hinted that the E was kind of iron and steel and kind of old tech. And the J is quite a, a different airplane by the sounds of things. Is that right? Um, Mark, it's completely different. And, and believe me, I was not an early adapter of the J model. In fact, when we were transitioning or talking about transitioning to the J, I said, you know, it, it's a, a mission that calls for a Jeep and you're building a Cadillac. Mm -hmm. We don't need this Cadillac to do this mission. We need the Jeep that can take a pounding. Uh, and then you start to fly the airplane and you see all the situational awareness tools that it has and all the power. Uh, you, you all know as pilots, uh, power can make up for a lot of sins. And, uh, and the J model has so much more power. I can remember my first flight in the J at, they didn't really have simulators then. So we would go down to Lockheed uh, in Marietta and go through their engineering simulator which was pretty good, but it wasn't the airplane. It wasn't like a flight simulator. It, you'd, it was the best they had. And we would go through that simulator. And then we'd go back to the unit and start flying. And on my first flight, and again, having thousands of hours of C-130 time, I go bombing down the runway and I, I start to rotate. And my instructor pilot is, is uh, saying, get your nose up, get your nose up, get your nose up. And I'm looking, I'm like, what are you talking about? But if you didn't get the nose up at first uncomfortably high in the J, you would overspeed the gear that fast. It had so much more power. It's It's got the new props, the new engines. Virtually everything is new on the airplane. And it actually hurt us initially because everybody in the Air Force would say, well, it's just another C-130. How tough can it be to transition from one model to the next? We've been doing it forever. It's it's not. It's totally different, and it's a great great improvement in operational capability. Uh, yeah, it's Larry, I just want to move move you on a little bit now. To um, you've talked about being in a hole in Guatemala, um, but I've seen a picture of you with someone who was really famous for getting things in holes. Um, this is you with Arnold Palmer. What's ah, this? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, uh, Scotty, that was a, a great memory for me. It was a tremendous opportunity that I had. Uh, a, a friend of mine, his name was Lee Lauterbach, is a big P-51 guy. Yeah. And, and he put together this air show called the Mustangs and Legends Air Show at Rickenbacker Field in Ohio in 2007. And he ended up with 77 P-51s on the ramp. And, and uh, we had the J model there because the J model can open the ramp and door at 250 knots, uh, whereas the legacy airplanes ha could only go 150. So the plan was I would lead all of the P-51s around uh, with the back door open, and we'd have the uh, photographers and videographers on the back of the airplane taking the pictures of all of these P-51s coming up three at a time as I circle the field. It was literally like you were in a World War II movie and it was phenomenal. Wow. And when, when we landed, Lee Lauterbach and I were walking in together to debrief the mission uh, since he was the lead P-51 pilot. And he said, uh, he said, Larry, would you mind coming over to say hello to a friend of mine? 
And I said, no, no, I'd be happy to. And, and we're walking over and he said, have you ever met Mr. Palmer? And I said, Arnold Palmer? And he's like, yeah. I said, no, I've never met Arnold Palmer. And, oh, he's going to be so happy to meet you. Well, Arnold Palmer holds the record for the fastest time around the world in a business jet uh, in, a Lear, yeah. in a Lear 36. Yeah. Lee Lauderback was Arnold's pilot and ran Arnold's flight operation for many, many years. And they're just extremely close friends, as you would imagine. And it was the coolest you know, it, uh, I do love golf, and it was that experience that combined my love of flying and my love of golf, and it could not have been better. It was so cool. That's awesome. Legend. How many, so, how many Mustangs did you say? 70? So they had 77 on the ground. And now, of course, some, they expected to have even more than that, but some couldn't get in because of weather and things like that and some mechanicals. Uh, and then we had, I, I, if I recall correctly, it was 24 in the formation. And then during our, our formation flying over the field, the P-51s would morph into the number 51. So when you looked up from the ground, you saw 50, 51 and they're all Mustangs. And the legends part of it, you know, earlier, Mark, you mentioned Bob Hoover. Um, I've had the, the pleasure of knowing Bob from, from my air show experience and, and running the air show in Rhode Island for years. Uh, Bob Hoover was there, and it was just the legends of aviation. Uh, it was a great, great experience. Yeah, yeah. He's a total gentleman. and uh, I mean, you obviously know him. I, I met him for about 10 seconds once, and I was just in awe and blown away. But um just he is a total gentleman, and as you say, if you ever watched his flying display, his flying displays were were a flight lesson to everybody. When he would go and shut down his motors and come in, and he'd do a loop with the engine shut down, but everything based on science and engineering, and he taught you so much. And I remember sitting with him, and we're having lunch, and he would say, he'd say, Larry, I hear you kids all the time. You say, oh, I'm, I'm going to carry a few knots here and I'm going to carry a few extra knots there. He'd say, if the book says fly 107 knots, you fly 107. And and I look at him and I said, Bob, I'm trying. It sounds yeah. like I'm not trying. I said, some of us just don't have that skill. He, he was just one of those tremendous human beings. And he was such a gentleman, as, as was Arnold Palmer one of the finest gentlemen you could ever meet. And when you see somebody that's legend like that, be such a gentleman, boy, it it's really does your heart good. Yeah, wonderful. So Larry, I'm gonna go from Warbirds and I'm gonna bring it up until sort of present day. And so you're now working for Lockheed Martin. And let me just get this right. You're the Director of Business Development for Air Mobility. Right. So what does that actually mean? What does your what does your current sort of role entail? So so as I tell everybody, I flew the airplanes for 30 years and now I get to sell them. Um, okay. So it is a it is a bit of a sales uh, position. But the the other thing that I really like about it is that I get direct input with our Skunk Works engineers and all the program engineers that we have. The brilliant people that continue to upgrade and modernize the airplane uh, year after year after year. And it's so neat to get to work with them and have an input as to how we really fly the airplane so they design things that actually fit better. And, and did you feel that that was kind of a natural progression for you? I, I did. Uh, because I've had so much experience with the various models of, of the C-130, from Lockheed's perspective, now, of course, they're selling the J and they're selling it around the world. But I had a different credibility with the customers to say, no, 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 no. Listen, I can tell you the differences firsthand. Here's the difference between these airplanes. And and it makes a big difference. I, so it's it was an easy transition for me to go to that. But I think very valuable as well, because I, I represent the customer's voice inside the company 
I understand how they fly the airplane so I can communicate that within the company uh, well, I think. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, it sounds like the, the 130 is just going on and on and on. Um, has it got a future sort of beyond the J? Is there something kind of in the, you mentioned skunk, skunk work, so we get very excited when anyone. <laughs> I, so so I think the airplane, I you know, everybody, they've doubted the C-130 for years. When I was in the service, they, they told us that the C-17 was going to replace the C-130s and the 141s. And I said, mm, I don't think so. Uh, and of course, it, it couldn't because of, of what it can uniquely do that other airplanes can't do. And, and one of my great friends uh, within the company, his name is Mike Acri, a Skunk Works. He runs our Skunk Works division in Marietta. And he said, if you were going to design an airplane from scratch today to do what a C-130 does, you would design it ostensibly the same as you did back then with a straight wing and the, the high wing and the propellers because it allows you to slow down, to do those refueling operations, to do the airdrop operations, to do all of those things. You get into the dirt and grass and gravel and everything else without destroying your motors. Uh, it was just an incredibly well-designed airplane. Now, we're still gonna do different things with it. As I, as I mentioned earlier, you'll see a laser on the C-130 you'll see the C-130 as a weapons delivery platform where, where we can launch major weapons out the back of the C-130. Uh, you will see it in some variants that, that I can't, I'm not at liberty to talk about in this format, but you will continue to see the C-130 evolve and just do more and more and more. And they tell everybody, they said, you, you always will need your pickup. No matter what, you'll have to have your pickup. And there's been no better pickup designed ever than the C-130. And they just keep improving it. So I think we're going to see C-130s around the world uh, for a long, long time. And, uh, and I think you'll, we're the longest continuously running military assembly line in history. And I think that will go on uh, for de decades longer. Yeah, so, so what was the airplane? I'm sorry, Mark, I couldn't uh, understand that. Oh, what was the first year of build for the for the 130? So, so the um, I'm the first airplane was delivered in '55. Wow. Uh, uh, the uh, so that was the I uh, use you, you started out. Um, uh, Willis Hawkins was the engineer who designed the airplane, and that was uh, that. That was uh, the first A model was fifty five. It was just a couple of years before that he designed that designed the airplane. Uh, so it, it's been running a long, long time. The first J models, operational J models, were ninety seven when they delivered to the UK as yeah. the launch customer for the airplanes. Yeah. Okay, so so as as a few people have said, you know, it's, Scotty was in kind of high school when the very first um, C one thirties were were designed. So uh, yeah, that's a, that is amazing, just amazing. And so uh, I guess the future of air mobility, the the one thirties are a part of that. The armies and and forces have got to move, and um, uh, disaster relief has got to happen, etc. But but what's your sort of sort of forward look well you know you're going to see autonomy and and that that is going to come into everything uh i think first in you might see it first in uh refueling because uh people are still a little leery i think of uh getting on an airplane that doesn't have a pilot in the front i mm -hmm. uh, but I think you'll see us go to single pilot operations and have a path to transition to fully automated uh, operations, particularly when you are just moving cargo uh, and the like. And, and that's just natural. You're going to see uh, defensive systems continue to improve to protect 
the larger aircraft so that we will be able to uh, continue to go wherever we need to go uh, throughout, uh, throughout the world. And in the past, we used to just go with fighters. We would go with fighter escort uh, wherever. <clears throat> when we were in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, we were flying, we were got deployed over to Mildenhall, and then from Mildenhall, we would uh, move airplanes down to uh, Turkey, down to Inserlik, and we'd fly from Inserlik into northern Iraq into a base called Sersink. Uh, and that's where, that was the center at the time of the Kurdish relief operation. And and we would, I think we would fly so close to Syria as to almost tease them to come up and try to do something. But we had A-10s in escort with us uh, that would love somebody to come up and try to to uh, reach out and touch us. Um, and, and I think, that's just evolved now, and now we'll carry more defensive systems on the airplane that protect us better. It, as laser technology gets better and better, uh, you may be able to have lasers protecting airplanes. Uh, so uh, the sky's the limit, as they say, uh, but I, I see the world with a, with a herc in it for quite a long time. Wow, amazing. Uh, and I'm really glad about that because it was my first love, my first girlfriend, if you want to call it that. So that's me reminiscing about my girlfriend now. Larry, um, we've got a couple of questions to finish off with. We ask these questions of everyone who comes on the show. Um, looking back at your career thus far, what are you most proud of? Uh, Scotty, you know, there, there's so much. Uh, but I would say uh, I'm proudest most of being so involved in Rhode Island, uh, trying to get the J and then acquiring the J and bringing the J online, because that really is the legacy for me. When I left the unit, I, I retired uh, from that unit in 2012. I knew that they were stable as TAC airlifters for the next 30 years. Uh, so I'm very proud to have been part of that. And, and of course, uh, if we weren't one of the first ones, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to lead that first deployment into the desert. So those things all get interconnected. But I would say that's probably it. OK, my question, Larry, what advice would you give your 10 year old self knowing what you know now? <laughs> uh, I would tell my 10 year old self. Um, to, to get ready uh, because you have no idea where the C-130 is going to take you in the world. I, but you're going to get to see the world. And, and I really did, uh, I'll be forever grateful for that. I think there's no better education than travel. And I'd like to think that I've uh, become very educated because of the C-130 and the places it has taken me, whether in conflict or whether in humanitarian relief or just in normal uh, missions that we would fly around the world. So I, I would tell that 10 year old boy to get ready, you're in for a heck of a ride, uh, but you, you've got a great machine to, to ride on. Perfect. But, but presumably, don't worry so much about the hockey. Yeah, don't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. Beware of people called Marcus. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> always beware of Marcus. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess, and the, the final questions from from me, Larry. Um, so, you know, we talked about the the absolute future, but in the next five years, you know, what's what's in your next five year time frame? So, actually, uh, the next five years, a lot of it is we're going to solidify a, a lot of C one hundred and thirty sales around the world. The U S is filling out with its C one hundred and thirties. Uh, although the Marine Corps wants an additional squadron of Hercs, uh, the Navy still is getting more Hercs, and, and we we have more to go in the U.S. with a lot of National Guard units. But at the international market for the Hercs is really going to be awesome. Uh, you're going to see a lot of internationals uh, recapitalize their old uh, Hercs, uh, and some that don't have Hercs even get on board. And then uh, from Lockheed Martin's perspective. We're also very involved in the refueling area, and we've got it. We're getting involved in strategic air refueling, not just the tactical refueling that the 130 does. We've uh, we formed a partnership with Airbus 
uh, to explore those opportunities. And we think the synergies of those two companies uh, are really phenomenal and we can really uh, provide a solution for the US government beyond the KC-46, which, which as you know, is coming on service right now. Yeah. Sounds amazing. Larry, uh, thank you so much for giving us your time. And, oh, it's been great. Thank you. I'm going to say, Larry, because I know we've a number of US viewers and, and certainly from us as beneficiaries, but thank you very much for your service as well. It's just wonderful. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> Larry, well, thanks for coming. Speak to you soon. Thanks, Larry. Okay. Wow. What a career, eh? <laughs> 130 stories are not that good. Yeah, they're rubbish. The yeah, 130 stories pale into insignificance, don't they? Oh, we were late checking into the hotel. Oh, the, they didn't have the wine I like, that sort of thing. <laughs> My baguette wasn't long enough. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we didn't have anything about Mustangs or Arnold Palmer or flying different ones. You just had, you know, all your hotel check-in issues. Yeah, I, I, it was very boring. I didn't do anything. Uh, interestingly, interestingly, though, I've been watching the chat, uh, and there was an interesting thing that came up in the chat, which I didn't know, um, uh, from Stephanie Stin, who is, in fact, the Lockheed Martin head of PR for the C-130. So she does, this is Jen, this. Um, Lockheed Martin employees were asked to enter a contest to name the C-130. Hercules won, but it was down to Hercules or Griffin. So it could have been the C-130 Griffin. Mm, wow. Hercules like sounds good. Yeah. And all you got yeah. when you... Way better. Yeah, um, so Linz, what have we got coming up next week? Oh, yeah, Linz. Scott, you're going to hate it. <laughs> oh, helicopters. So it's helicopter month. Um, so if you don't turn up, we totally understand. Mark and I can understand. we can we can do this on our own. But we have Neil Jeffers, who's the chief pilot uh, with London Air Ambulance. So he's going to come on, talk to us about working in challenging conditions in London, a little bit about HEMS, and it's going to be really exciting. Let's face it, that is cool. It, and it, it is, is, is pretty cool. cool. And you all know with air ambulances or with ambulances generally. Yeah, uh -huh. I do have a link with ambulances. So I've, this one I've got to. I've been scooped up by an air ambulance. So I feel like yeah. we're going to be kindred spirits. We, we have a, a customer. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we forgot to mention that when we went back to the Jerusalem a dance thing, that actually you are the only one with a formal qualification in dance as well, Lindsay, yeah, with your A-level like in dance. So you could, in fact, teach Mark and I to do that thing. No, no, On that no, note. No. <laughs> Everyone, thanks for a great show. See you next week. Bye. Bye.